I'm going to introduce Steve. And first of all, thank you, Steve. I know a lot of work went into the presentation. And of course, a lot of work went into your trip to uh, capture all of these beautiful pictures and scenes from life in Egypt and Jordan. A little bit about Steve, for those of you who don't know him. Uh, Steve is a resident of Arizona ever since he retired from General Electric. He lives in Phoenix with his wife, Arlene, since 2008. And thank you very much for presenting today. He is going to be able to present and answer any questions you might have about this virtual tour of the countries of Egypt and Jordan. So thank you. And just bear with him while he puts up his presentation PowerPoint. Okay, thank you for the introduction, Levy. I'd like to welcome everybody, uh, including some of my uh, co-travelers, my wife, Arlene, and my sister and brother-in-law, uh, David and Beth Askerson. So this uh, presentation will cover my two trips to Egypt and one trip to Jordan. The map shows Egypt and the Sinai Desert so hold on, Steve, you, you didn't share the screen with us. You have it on your screen, but not on ours. So no. go back into Zoom and just hit the green button. Perfect. OK. I'll start over. Uh, the presentation covers two trips to Egypt I made and one trip to Jordan. The map shows Egypt and the Sinai Desert to the west of Israel and Jordan and the, on the east side and the Jordan River, which is the dividing boundary between Israel and Jordan. The first trip occurred in February of 1985, when I took a bus trip from Jerusalem to Cairo, along with 40 other passengers, some just using it for transportation and others on either a four day or seven day escorted tour. The trip to the Egyptian border took a few hours, at which point we were unloaded from the bus at this uh, no man's land and made to wait for four hours until we got an Egyptian bus to take us on to Cairo. All I remember is miles of Sinai desert sand, some Bedouin tents, and a few towns. At the Suez Canal, the bus drove onto a raft which conveyed us across. Cairo is a wild place, eight lanes of traffic and no traffic lights with people jumping on and off moving buses. I remember hearing stories of tourists having to hire taxis to get across streets. And I could see that this was true. I didn't try to cross any main arteries. My hotel was old and directly across from the Soviet embassy. The room was a suite and the lights would mysteriously go on and off of their own volition. Being in Cairo alone at that time, only six years after the Israeli-Egyptian peace treaty was signed, was spooky enough without that. I felt uncomfortable walking on the streets. There were soldiers with blank expressions patrolling the streets armed with what looked like World War I surplus rifles. A tour of the city included a visit to the Ben Ezra Synagogue, which was a museum. There was an elderly caretaker who showed us around. We passed an area where workers were, pairing, were repairing some stonework using labor intensive techniques that must have been thousands of years old. 
There was no high tech in Egypt in 1985. Returning to Israel was an experience. It turned out that I was the only one in the group returning by plane. The others were either continuing on to Luxor by train or returning to Israel by bus. I was picked up at the hotel at 4 a.m. and loaded into a van by two guys who didn't appear to speak any English. It was pitch black outside as we drove to the airport and I was petrified. The van stopped at the airport and a porter grabbed my suitcase and escorted me to the check-in counter. I went into a lounge to wait for my flight to be called. The other people in the lounge were all wearing flowing Arab dress. I wondered why they were going to Israel. The question was answered when another flight was called and they all departed to some more suitable destination, leaving me all alone. The passengers on the flight to Israel consisted of me and a British couple. After 34 years, I made a return trip to Egypt so I could take the Nile River cruise, which I missed in 1985. In February of 2019, my wife and I and my sister and brother-in-law took a two week trip to Egypt, Jordan and Israel, which began with three plane flights to arrive in Cairo, Egypt. We were met at the airport after midnight and delivered to our hotel. So this is really the first view of Egypt that we got from our hotel, looking towards Giza where the pyramids are located. And throughout the presentation, there's many street scenes. Um, they did have cars in Cairo, but that the uh, local traffic was much more interesting than photographing cars. The next day we began our sightseeing with a group of 11, our guide and a plainclothes police officer armed with an automatic rifle. The group size changed daily throughout the Egyptian portion of the trip. Security was not an issue throughout our travels in Egypt with frequent police checkpoints, especially in Cairo. The first stop was the ancient city of Memphis, containing the impressive, impressive Colossus of Ramses. This is Ramses lying down. And the burial ground of Saqqara, which featured the step pyramids of Zoser considered the oldest in Egypt. Step pyramids use flat platforms receding from the ground up to form a shape similar to a geometric pyramid. This is the whole family uh, in the cart with their uh, two donkeys and two cows. This woman, in addition to baking bread, was doing tongue singing as part of the entertainment. After lunch, we visited the pyramids and the Sphinx in Giza and had a brief camel ride. This was my third camel ride. This is my sister behind me on another camel previously having been on camels in Israel and Kenya. The great pyramids of Giza built 4,500 years ago were giant tombs for the mummies of pharaohs Khufu, Khafre, and Menkuri, who were father, son, and grandson. The area in front of the pyramids was full of tourists and Egyptians offering camel rides and there was an overwhelming stench of camel dung. The 
The following day, we visited the Egyptian Museum in Cairo and had a tour of old Cairo, which included visits to the Saladin Citadel, the Coptic and Caravan churches, and the Khan El Khalili Bazaar. So this is a panoramic view of Cairo. This is a houseboat in the Nile. Um, this apparently had more than one family living on it. This is the uh, Khan Al Khalili Bazaar, which is the center of commercial activity, similar to the Shuk in Jerusalem. This woman, I think, was delivering bread to a street stall, as well as this guy. And these are some of the uh, vendors selling their wares on the street. That evening, we flew to Luxor to board our cruise ship, the Semiramis II. The ship had 70 cabins. These are some of the street views around Luxor. The family transport. This is an example of the security. These uh, guards are overlooking the road in Luxor. Our third day started with visits to the Karnak and Luxor temples. The Karnak temples comprised the largest temple complex in Egypt, built over a period of 1300 years to honor the god Amun-Ra of Thebes, his wife Mut and son Mantu. It contained over 25 temples full of sanctuaries, big columns, and obelisks. Luxor Temple was also dedicated to Amun-Ra, the king of gods, and his wife, Mut, the goddess of war. It contained colossal statues of Ramses and large 24 meter tall carved pylons. It also contained the mosque of Omar of Abu el Hagag which was built on top of the buried ruins of Luxor Temple. After the temple was uncovered, the mosque was preserved and was still a place of worship. <clears throat> the next day began with a visit to the Valley of the Kings, which was most famous for being the place with Tuk Hank Tutankhamun's tomb was discovered. We had previously gotten to see Tutankhamun's burial treasures in the Cairo Egyptian Museum. Sixty-three tombs have been discovered, but only eight were open for visits. Our admission ticket entitled us to visit three and our guide directed us to the tombs of Ramses the seventh, Ramses the fourth, and Ramses the ninth. The Tankamon's tomb was open, but required a special ticket, and a special ticket was also necessary to take photos in any of the tombs, which means I didn't take any of these tomb pictures. I, I unloaded them from the internet. I would never have been able to take such good pictures because apparently they did this 
with additional light and a tripod, which I didn't have. Next stop was at the mortuary temple of Hatshepsut, the first female pharaoh set at the head of the valley. This temple was the best example of Egyptian classical style architecture and was built to express the grandeur of the pharaoh as well as honoring the gods that she would need in the afterlife. After her death, all of her statues were defaced by her son, Tothamos III. We also visited an alabaster workshop between temples. We finished our sightseeing, sightseeing with a stop at the Colossi of Memnon to see two massive stone statues of Pharaoh Amenhotep III and the remains of the mortuary temple of Amenhotep. That evening we set sail for Edfu and at dinner we dressed in galabias, the traditional Egyptian garment. Throughout our cruise, we got to see life along the banks of the Nile. At villages with limited docking facilities, boats would be lined up in parallel and passengers would have to walk through the closer boats to get to their own. These are some of the views along the Nile. This is a dredge <clears throat> boat. At Edfu the next morning, we took a horse carriage ride to visit the temple of Edfu, which was built in the Greco-Roman era to honor Horus, the fountain-headed god. The walls were lined with inscriptions and hieroglyphics depicting the age-old struggle between Horus and Seth. <clears throat> this is the town of Edfu. And back to the Nile. Now, a lot of the buildings we saw had this semi-finished construction. Whenever they built a level, they, they began the beginnings of the next level so that when a family expanded, they would be able to build more housing. This is a laundry day on the Nile. Some friendly folk. <clears throat> this is a biblical scene, Pharaoh's seven calves from his dream that Joseph interpreted. We then sailed to Aswan for an evening visit to the temple of Kam Ombo, overlooking the Nile in the town of the same name, 25 miles north of Aswan. Built to honor the crocodile and falcon gods Sorek and Horus in 180 before the common era, it had beautifully carved columns, some with their original brilliant colors.
The following day, we drove to Abu Simbel to visit the Abu Simbel temples, which were carved out of the rock on a mountainside in the 13th century before the Common Era. The larger Ramses II temple and the smaller temple for Queen Nefertari were built to commemorate Ramses' victory at the Battle of Kadesh. This is Apple symbol, the town. The temples were relocated in 1968 to their present site when they would have been submerged during the creation of Lake Nasser, the massive artificial water reservoir formed after the building of the Aswan High Dam on the Nile River. So this was the original dam on the Nile, which was built in the early 1900s, but it still caused major flooding along the Nile. So the, the High Dam was built when finished in 1970. This project was considered to be one of the greatest achievements in modern engineering. This is Aswan, a town. <clears throat> this is another biblical scene, uh, Moses full rushes. I looked around for a baby in a basket, but I didn't see any. <clears throat> in the afternoon, we took an excursion to visit a house in a Nubian village on the Nile, arriving by motorboat. The Nubians were an ethnic group coming from southern Egypt and northern Sudan, who during the course of history started a number of settlements along the Nile River. <clears throat> the houses in the village were painted sky blue. And the main street was lined with market stalls selling colorful spices, coffee, and handicrafts. The family in the house we visited served us tea and allowed us to tour and photograph the house where handicrafts were also sold. The two pens in the main room where pet crocodiles were kept. My wife and I each held a four foot baby crocodile, albeit with its snout tied shut, which made about 30 pounds. <clears throat> on last day on board, the cruise ship began with a visit to the temple of Philae located on the island of Agilica, dated from, the, from 380 before the Common Era. Erected to honor the goddess Isis, it was relocated from its original site on the holy island of Philae in the middle of Lake Nasser in 1960. From there, we moved to the Aswan High Dam, High Dam <clears throat> bordering Egypt and Sudan, the world's largest dam, which was completed in 1970. It changed the life of the Egyptian people by providing flood protection, irrigation, and electricity. These are students of Aswan. The morning concluded with a Falooka ride on the Nile, where we sailed around Elephantine Island and passed the famous Aswan Botanical Garden. We 
were then delivered to the Aswan airport with a box lunch for our flight back to Cairo. Early, <clears throat> early the next morning, we returned to the Cairo airport and flew to Amman, Jordan, where we were met by our guide who started our sightseeing with a visit to Ajlan Castle a 12th century Muslim castle situated on top of a mountain. These are scenes of Aswan, of Amman. Okay, here we are at the castle. The castle stood on the ruins of a monastery, traces of which were discovered during archeological excavations and contained a maze of corridors and floors that offered a beautiful view of the surrounding area and interesting archeological, architectural styles. There was also a museum exhibition with many interesting artifacts from the various time periods of the region. We were supposed to have an included Bedouin lunch the next day at Wadi Rum, but our guide convinced us that it would be full of sand and instead arranged a lunch at the Green Valley restaurant in Jarash. This is Amman. And here we are at the Green Valley restaurant. This uh, fellow was baking bread in the oven behind them, which was served at lunch. There were many excellent dishes served family style, including flatbread that we saw being baked and too much food to eat. We next visited the ancient Roman city of Jerash which featured a beautiful blend of Roman and Middle Eastern architectures. This is a panoramic of uh, ancient Jerash in the foreground and the modern city in the rear. The ancient and modern cities are located directly beside each other, separated only by a wall. The sites we saw included the Hippodrome, a partially restored Roman era stadium, the Temple of Artemis, Hadrian's Arch, and the remains of the city gates. The next day began with a drive to Wadi Rum, the Valley of the Moon, a valley cut into the sandstone and granite rock of Southern Jordan. Wadi Rum was like a moonscape of ancient valleys and towering weathered sandstone mountains rising out of white and pink colored sands. Our tour vehicle was a Bedouin Jeep, which was really a four wheel drive pickup truck with bench seats on the truck bed. Toilet facilities in Wadi Rum were plentiful since all that was required was to go behind the rock formation. After admiring the scenery, we made a stop at a Bedouin tent for some tea and conveniently the opportunity to buy some handicrafts. In the late afternoon, we made it to Petra, the pink city, which was supposed to be the highlight of our Jordan experience. 
Petra was unique in that the city was carved out of a massive rock face more than 2,000 years ago and became the capital city of the Nabataean kingdom. This is a, a carriage that would take tourists, two people at a time, into the uh, ancient city. The other option was to hire a donkey or to walk in. The Nabataeans were nomadic Arabs who took advantage of Petra's proximity to the trade routes by establishing it as a major regional training hub. The Nabataean kingdom lost its independence to the Romans in 106 of the Common Era, and Petra was renamed Arabia Petria. Petra's importance declined as sea trade routes emerged and a 363 Common Era earthquake destroyed many structures. The Byzantine era visited, witnessed the construction of several Christian churches, but the city continued to decline and by the early Islamic era became an abandoned place where only a handful of nomads lived. It remained unknown to the world until it was rediscovered in 1812. This is uh, at the entrance where you walk in. Since we arrived late in the day, we were not able to see all of Petra as it was a two and a half mile walk and an 800 step climb to the monastery at the end and it was getting dark. My wife and sister shared a carriage drawn, a horse drawn carriage from the sick entrance and an impressive long winding opening between the walls of the two overhanging cliffs to the treasury. And my brother-in-law and I walked in with our guide. Along the way, we saw tombs carved into the rock, sacrificial altars, and interesting rock formations. We got as far as the treasury where we met up with the ladies. So this is our first view of the treasury. The treasury carved out of a sandstone rock face was one of the most elaborate temples in Petra and was believed to have been the mausoleum of the Nabataean king, Aretas IV in the first century of the common era. It became known as al Kazer or the treasury in the early 19th century by the area's Bedouins as they believed it contained treasures. <clears throat> so this is in the plaza in front of the treasury where you could uh, hire a camel to get back out. And, and or a carriage. The next morning, we drove to the Allenby Bridge, which was one of the crossings from Jordan to Israel. Along the way, we saw hilly terrain and passed the Bedouin encampments. These are some of the views that we had. Near the bridge, we got a good view of the southern portion of the Dead Sea. This is one of the roads we took. So that's the Dead Sea in the background. This is a Bedouin encampment. Again, the Dead Sea, that's the West Bank of Israel 
in the background. We also saw a stone pillar named Lot's wife, who was turned into a pillar of salt in the Bible story. The crossing into Israel was difficult because we had to take a transit bus, which traversed the approximately five miles of road between the borders of the two countries. Three days later, we returned to the border crossing and reversed the transit process to get back to Jordan. At the Jordanian side, we were met by the same guide and driver that we had previously. On our drive to our first stop, Madaba, we had an excellent view of Mount Nebo, where Moses spent the last day of his life and was allowed to look into the promised land without being allowed to enter. Madaba was best known for its spectacular Byzantine and Amayyad mosaics, particularly the sixth century mosaic map of Jerusalem and the Holy Land, the replica of which we had seen in the Cardo in Jerusalem. It originally contained two million pieces of vividly colored local stones depicting hills and valleys, villages and towns as far as the Nile Delta. The map, only about a quarter of which was preserved, covered the floor of the Greek Orthodox Church of St. George. The church was built in 1896 of the Common Era over the remains of a much earlier sixth century Byzantine church. This is Madara. That's King Abdullah II, the King of Jordan. We visited a mosaic shop. <clears throat> we then drove up to Mount Nebo to stand on the ridge where Moses had his view of the promised land. The view from the Mount Nebo Memorial located on the summit, looking out over the northern portion of the Dead Sea, provided a panorama of the Holy Land. And to the north, a more limited, limited one of the Valley of the River Jordan. This is the memorial on top of the mountain. It was cloudy and the visibility wasn't great, so I hope that Moses had a clear day for a good view on the last day of his life. We visited the Basilica of Moses on the top of the mountain, which was constructed around the fourth century of the Common Era and had just undergone major reconstruction. After a stop at a resort on the Dead Sea, we arrived in Amman, the capital and most populous city of Jordan, in late afternoon, and drove through the city to the Citadel, a historical site on a hill in the center of downtown. Fortification walls enclosed the heart of the site, which we didn't enter but we were able to see the remains of the Temple of Hercules within the walls, the most significant Roman structure in the citadel. The Citadel Hill also provided an excellent panorama of the city. We then went to the Roman theater, a 6,000 seat theater built into the hillside in the second century of the Common Era when the city was known as Philadelphia. Our guide demonstrated the excellent acoustics of the theater. In addition, we saw the nearby Odeon built at roughly the same time, a 500 seat theater 
that was still in use for music concerts. A short distance away was the Nymphium, a partially preserved Roman public fountain, which we also visited. This concluded our Amman sightseeing and after an elaborate farewell dinner, we were deposited at the Amman airport for our return trip home. The end. Thank you. Um, a couple questions for you before others ask questions. First of all, how many of the people on the store were Jewish? And I guess, did you feel any uh, sense of lack of safety because of that? No feeling at all of lack of safety. Um, outside of my wife and I and sister and brother-in-law, I don't recall meeting any other Jews, but we made it known up front that we were Jewish and there was no issue. Nice. And then you said the, the second trip that you did, I know the first uh, few pictures were in the 80s. When was the second trip? Second trip was in uh, February of 2019. Okay, so no, a little over a year ago, a 34 year lag between the two. And poverty, I know in the pictures you see a lot of poverty. Is that prevalent everywhere? Yeah, well, it's like any third world country. Uh, in the large cities, you can see wealth. And if you go out in the countryside or, or into the poorer areas of the cities, you still see that. All right, then here's a question from the chat. And then anyone else who has questions, please um, feel free to use the chat or your mic. Um, why did, this is in Cairo, you, you had mentioned that you had a police escort. There was always a police officer or some sort of security person. Was yeah. that because you were tourists or that was an extra? No, I think all the tour groups have that. And it turned out that we didn't have it every day on the bus. Whenever the police department had a spare uh, guy with a uh, rifle to, to, to send out, he got loaded on the bus. But there were some days when that wasn't the case. However, there were, there were checkpoints every few blocks where the bus was uh, stopped and the officers would look in and see everything was okay. So at no time did we feel insecure. And then um, the second question that Ellen asked was, where were the women buried? Where so a lot of the, a lot of the, I guess, images that people see, and of course that you shared were different pharaohs. I know that you showed that tomb of the woman. Oh, okay. Yeah, women got buried in tombs as well. Yes. It, they were treated with as much respect as the men. Okay. And then what was the reason why her son defaced, you, you mentioned for that female pharaoh? Um, I guess uh, he wanted to be honored rather than his mother. Okay. All right. Any other questions? I know I asked a few. And Arlene mentioned, if you looked in the chat uh, regarding the guards, she said that Egypt had an explosion in that market the following week after they left. And that's why there's so much security over there. They want to make sure, I'm adding, I'm assuming they want to make sure their tourist industry works well as well. Um, any questions, feel free to unmute your mic or use your chat. It's a lot of silence here. I had trouble getting on on my computer. And when I opened up my my um, iPad, it went right to FaceTime, F Face no, Facebook. Oh, so you're... Did anybody else have trouble with that? Nope. So you got knocked off somehow? Well, this is recorded. And if anyone wants to look at it again, uh, there's, we'll be on Facebook and on YouTube. All of our record, all of our Zoom virtual presentations are recorded. You can go back. There's over a hundred videos. We've done over a hundred virtual um, presentations. So those are all on YouTube and on Facebook. Uh, any questions for Steve? See, this is, for me, I love this. I mean, I don't know that I'll ever take a trip to Jordan and Egypt. So uh, it's not on my bucket list as they say, but I always love seeing it um, in pictures and it's, it's not, 
just from some fancy magazine. It's like, you know, this is the inside scoop of it. So thank you. Okay, it was my pleasure. So again, if anyone has a question, I'm gonna stop the live feed on Facebook, but again, you can definitely unmute your mic, ask Steve any questions you have and uh, don't be shy. Thank you again, Steve, for all the time that you put into this and for today, thank you. Okay.